All right, special senses, the ear. Again, going back to that idea that special senses only happen in really specific locations in our body. The ear is involved in hearing, but it's also involved in balance. And the types of receptors that we have that are um, involved in both our hearing and our balance are called mechanoreceptors. Mechano, that's supposed to be an E, receptors. Now, if you think back to A and P1, mechanical meant physically they have to be moved. So these, uh, sorry guys, these cells have little hairs on their top and when they get compressed and actually bent is when they send signal. So we say that it is a mechanoreceptor because it actually has to be physically moved in order for it to work. Now, the sound itself is a function of um, waves, actually. It's wavelength. So the, the waves created by sound waves can actually cause movement. And we um, talk about, you know, sound and wavelength and when the waves are very far away, something like that, it's going to be a very low sound. But if it's really, really close together like this, then it would be, <clears throat> excuse me, it would be a very high pitch sound, kind of like Minnie Mouse. Now, we um, also have uh, the ability to hear different levels of sound. So, for example, if I were to turn up the volume on this sound here, the waves would get taller, but the distance, whoops, but the distance between them wouldn't change. So <clears throat> that amplitude, that, that louder sound um, is more of a decibel thing than it is actually a frequency thing, which how frequent are the waves, that tells you how high the pitch is going to be. Again, really, really frequent waves, you got mini Mouse, not so frequent waves, you've got Barry White. Um, the balance that we have in our ears, that sense of balance that we have in our ears, you can consider it proprioception. Proprioception. Proprioception is a very fancy way of saying body position. So your head is always being pulled on by gravity. If I'm standing straight up, gravity is yanking down. If I'm laying on my stomach, gravity is pulling forward. If I'm laying on my back, it's pulling backwards, right? It's pulling posterior. That is one type of balance that we have in our ear. It's the static balance. Basically meaning when we're not moving, how is gravity yanking on me? Now, the other type of balance that we have that's in our ear is called dynamic balance. Dynamic, there we go. Dynamic balance tells you when your head has shifted and moved. So let's say that I do a cartwheel and you know you go from here to flipping all the way over until you're back to here. That movement of my head is actually picked up by the organ in my ear as dynamic balance. It tells me that my head is moving through space. Now, something that's kind of interesting, um, you know how I've got an ear infection. I told you guys that in the welcome video, right? Well, one of the things that I've been experiencing with my little ear infection is I keep having dizzy spells. And one of the reasons that that is, is because that infection that's in my ear is actually affecting these two organs here. So let's start looking at the parts and pieces of um, our special senses of hearing. So our external ear, our external ear actually does have quite a few parts and pieces. And to be honest, our external ear, which can be called the oracle, 
Okay, if you've ever seen the never ending story, he goes to talk to the oracles is actually a funnel. So you know how we have funnels so that we can put stuff into um, bottles or into containers. This outer kind of bell shaped area is what this is. It harvests sound waves and then puts them down into basically the spigot of our funnel. So looking at an ear, the outer portion out here is called the helix. Now internally, you kind of have another sticky outy part, but it's still within the confines of that helix. This is the anti-helix, okay? That flat portion inside is called the concha. And this flat portion right underneath where that helix is at the top is going to be the triangular fossa. And if you look at the shape, kind of looks like a triangle, right? As we come down, anybody who's ever had their ear pierced knows that's the earlobe. And then you've got this bump kind of in the front of your ear. It makes the other half of our funnel. That's the tragus. And at the top of the earlobe, this bump right here is the antitragus. Okay? So you've got all of these parts and pieces that are just on your ear itself. <clears throat> Looking at a model, same parts and pieces. You've got the helix, you've got the anti-helix. You've got the triangular fossa up here. You've got that flat inside, the concha, the tragus, the anti-tragus, and the earlobe. The parts and pieces haven't changed. It's just a model. Now, beautiful hand-drawn picture of an ear. The oracle is the funnel, right? We talked about that, that funnel part of our ear. If you've ever seen the original Pete's Dragon, when the shyster's coming to town trying to sell his elixir that helps cure everything, the, the shyster's um, partner acts like an old lady and has a horn in their ear, and he keeps going, eh, right? That's actually how they made hearing aids back then, because what it did was it took the funnel of the ear and made it huge so that any sound wave would be caught in there. Then it got dragged into the inner ear. So we have three regions to our ear. From the tympanic membrane here, all the way out to the oracle out here, is the outer ear. This is where you can take a Q-tip and clean your ear. The smallest little region of our ear is the middle ear right here. And then internally, actually embedded in the temporal bone of the skull, is going to be where you have your inner ear. And again, this is like the perfect drawing. So looking at a model, you have the same parts and pieces. You've got the outer ear out here. You've got the oracle, that tube, the end of that tube. You've got the middle ear right here, which I know this picture is terrible for, but I promise I've got better pictures. And then you've got the inner ear, which again is embedded in the skull bone here, okay? It's embedded in the temporal bone of the skull. So looking at the specific parts of our outer ear, we have the oracle. Again, this is our funnel. Okay, now those sound waves are directed in through this little dude right here. This is the external auditory meatus. So I'm harvesting sound waves with my funnel and they're all coming in through this external auditory meatus to hit this little dude right here. This is the tympanic membrane. For anybody who's a band nerd, you know what a tympani is or a kettle drum or the copper drums in the back. That tympanic membrane is also known as the eardrum. So as sound waves come in, they bounce off of this, causing this to vibrate, okay? Internally, inside of my middle ear, you also have a tube called the eustachian tube. The eustachian tube actually drains any fluid that is in this space. Now, normally, that middle ear space doesn't have any fluid. 
That's why when you get an ear infection, it hurts so bad because you swell in this space that shouldn't have any fluid and it's filling with fluid. It causes this tympanic membrane to bulge out. And when a kid has an ear infection and they hurt and hurt and hurt, their eardrum eventually ruptures. It busts like a balloon. And it seems like after that, they're okay. One of the reasons is because they're not feeling the pain of the pressure on that tympanic membrane. Everybody here has probably cleaned out your ears and gone a little too far with that Q-tip and it hurts like crazy. Now imagine it being pushed from the inside out. Yeah, not a good sensation. So these are the parts of our outer ear, the auricle, the external auditory meatus, the tympanic membrane. And then the eustachian tube technically is part of the middle ear, but I'm just mentioning it here because it's far enough away we can actually see it. So looking at our model, again, auricle, external auditory canal or meatus, and you can see that this actually is in the temporal bone. When you learn the parts of the skull, it's right there. And then this is the tympanic membrane, and this is that eustachian tube. Okay, let's move on to the middle ear. So in the middle ear, it's this little area right here. Okay, so I'm going to blow that up. So in that little area right there, you have the three smallest bones in the whole human body. One, two, three three. Okay. So those are the three smallest bones in the human body. And if you look, here's my tympanic membrane, right? Look at this guy. This guy is actually attached to that tympanic membrane. So when this guy vibrates, it causes a chain reaction and this guy vibrates back and forth, which hits this guy that vibrates back and forth that in turn is attached to this guy that vibrates back and forth. So remember I told you this is mechanical stimuli. It's actually physical movement. Well, this guy vibrating back and forth here causes that chain reaction to happen in the middle ear so that it can hopefully be carried into the inner ear. So let's talk about what these are called. So here's my middle ear. This is called the malleus or the hammer. So if you think of the word mallet, the mallet is used to hit the drum, right? The next portion is the incus or the anvil, okay? So in Bugs Bunny, Wild E. Coyote is always trying to hit Roadrunner with an anvil. Looks like this. And you've got this little piquito at the end here. So back in the day, when you had a blacksmith in town, the blacksmith used to have a forge and he would hammer horseshoes and swords and axes and pickaxes and all of those things. But in order to heat the metal enough to make it malleable enough for him to hammer into the shape he wanted, he had to like super heat this metal. Well, you can't superheat metal like that and then put it on a wooden table to hammer it into the shape you want. The table would burn. So you had an anvil. So you would put the sword or whatever on here, and then you would use a hammer to bang this into shape. So this being the hammer and this being the anvil actually makes sense. The idea of those names makes sense. And I'm pretty sure the reason they called it the anvil is because if you look, can you see the little piquito right here? There's the little piquito right there, okay? Now, I said that the malleus vibrates and it hits the incus. The hammer vibrates and it hits the anvil. The anvil vibrates and it hits this little dude right here. This is the stapes, also known as the stirrup. And since we're all from Texas, we all know what a stirrup looks like, which it looks like this. Now, that chain reaction actually vibrates this foot of the stirrup back and forth, and that's what carries the signal into the inner ear, okay? Now let's look at just a couple more things that are actually here in the middle ear, okay? 
right under the foot of this stapes is something called the oval window. If I were to take this off, you would see something like this that has a membrane on top of it that when this vibrates back and forth, it causes this to vibrate back and forth too. As well as that, you've got this little dude down here. This is the round window. And as sound goes into your ear, it actually has a direction that allows it to go around and then back to this round window. Now, why would I wanna do that? The reason you wanna do that is because it dampens the sound. Once it hits the round window, the signal has gone through once and we're done. Remember we talked about light bouncing around in our eye like a ping pong ball, right? Same holds true for your ears. I want to hear the sound once and be done with it. I don't want to hear echoes like I'm in the Grand Canyon. So what do you do? Well, at the end of the trip of the waves, the sound waves, we put something that dampens them so that they can't feed back. Okay, so that's the middle ear. Middle ear, we've got the hammer, the anvil, the stirrup, the oval window, and the round window. And again, this is the tympanic membrane, the end of um, the external ear. So looking at it again from kind of another angle, remember I told you that little piquito was there? There's the anvil or the incus. Here's the malleus, okay? How do I know? Because of their position. Sorry. So here's my tympanic membrane. Remember that the hammer is attached to that tympanic membrane. Then the hammer hits the anvil, little piquito. And then the anvil is attached to the stapes. See that little oval? When it is intact in an ear, it's covering up that oval window and has actually attached to that oval window. And not that you need to know it for the test, but these two muscles here, or for the practical, I should say. For your lecture exam, yes, you need to know these. These are going to be the smallest muscles you have in your body. And they actually control the tension on the tympanic membrane in this case, and the tension on the stapes in this case. If you are in a like really loud concert, let's say you go to see, I don't know, Breaking Benjamin, and the the sound is very, very loud. If you don't have a way to loosen all of this up, it'll tear. It's like having a snare drum and hitting it with all the force you have with a mallet. If you do that, the head of the snare drum will tear. But if you loosen all of this up, then those sound waves don't do near as much damage. All right. So this is an up close personal look of the tympanic membrane. Here's the hammer, there's the anvil, and back here is the stirrup. But that's a really bad angle, right? So let's look at it from another angle. Hang on. There we go. Sorry. So here's the tympanic membrane. Here's the malleus or the hammer that's attached to it. Here's the incus, that little piquito, that is attached to the stirrup, okay? So you've got the middle ear and there's that eustachian tube we talked about. Let me make sure that that was what I had. Yeah, okay. So inner ear. So the foot of the stapes is the end of the middle ear. So this here is the inner ear. These are the structures that we have in the inner ear. Oddly enough, these structures are actually bored out of the skull bone in the temporal bone. So think about um, having an ant farm. The ants burrow a specific pattern through the sand, but technically, what they're burrowing is a lack of something, right? It's the tunnel. It's not that there's actual substance inside of that tunnel. Well, this is kind of like the ant farm. 
there's a tunnel inside of your temporal bone that follows these shapes. Okay, so blowing that up, you have this snail shell, this kind of big bulgy region here, and then these loops. Okay, so let's talk about those. These loops are called the semicircular canals. They work in dynamic balance. Remember I told you how your head is moving, me doing a cartwheel, not that I could do that, but just go with me on my journey. These semicircular canals, you actually have three. And if you think back to geometry, three dimensions were the X, the Y, and the Z axis, right? So each one of these is oriented along one of the three dimensional axes. That's why it gives you information about movement, okay? Now, down here, this big kind of bulgy area down here, this is the vestibule. The vestibule is involved in static balance. This is the part of the ear that tells you which way gravity is yanking on you. It also, believe it or not, tells you um, about acceleration and deceleration. If you've ever fallen asleep in a car and they stop and you wake up and they don't wake you up, this is actually the organ that says, oh, we're slowing down. You need to wake up because we're slowing down. Okay. So we've got static balance with the vestibule, dynamic balance with the semicircular canals. And then finally, we have the cochlea. This little dude right here is our hearing. Okay, remember the foot of the stapes vibrating over here? That actually sends signal down into the snail shell. And that helps us to hear. Now, this nerve, this actual bundle of nerves right here, this is the vestibulocochlear nerve. So the information coming in from the semicircular canals and the vestibule and the cochlea all follow this nerve up to your brain to get decoded. Remember that your brain has to do the decoding. It's not happening in your ear. It's happening in your brain. Your brain gets the signal, but it has to decode what that signal means. So looking at it on the model, here's your cochlea, there's my snail shell, there's the vestibule, that big fat part right there, and then one, two, three, there are my semicircular canals. This is that vestibulocochlear nerve that I was talking about that takes the signal up, okay? So if I were to take my cochlea and slice it down like this, histiologically, you can actually see um, the parts and pieces inside of the cochlea. So this is what I did. I sliced it. And then if it were a cinnamon roll like this, you're looking at it straight forward like this after I sliced it. So this is what you would see. You've got a space above and a space below that purple balloon that you see in here. See that? Okay. So you've got the scala vestibuli. It's a tunnel made out of bone above the purple balloon. You also have a tunnel below the balloon. See it right here? That is called the scala tympani. Okay. The purple balloon, this little dude right here, is called the cochlear duct. Duct is a fancy way of saying tube. So don't let that throw you. It's just a tube. And again, if I go back to this picture here, you can see that tube right there. It's following the same shape as the cinnamon roll. That's all we're looking at. Okay. So. When you look at the cochlear duct, you'll notice that I've got kind of a wall in between. Let me get a better color than that. A wall in between 
where the cochlear duct is, and my scala vestibuli. This is called the vestibular membrane. It is very simple. It's very thin. It, it's going to be your landmark when you're looking at the histology, okay? Because it's basically one simple um, squamous layer of cells. So it's very easy to identify. Looking at the wall between my cochlear duct and my scala tympani, I want you to notice that there is a bunch of cells here. Okay? This is called the basular membrane. Now the basular membrane is more interesting because this is where the cells that allow me to hear are, okay? That spiral organ, that snail shell organ, is often called the organ of Cordy. Guess who discovered it? So let's look at a slide. Here we go. Here's that bony tube above, bony tube below, and then my purple balloon in the middle. Remember I told you that the um, vestibular membrane was the one that I always used to see where things were because it was real simple. See that one layer of squish cells? That's the vestibular membrane. So we've got the vestibular membrane. We've got the scala vestibuli on top, the cochlear duct, that's that purple balloon that you saw, the basular membrane. Remember I said that's the one that's interesting because it has all the parts and pieces on it that help us to hear. So that's that. And then the scala tympani, which is that tube below our purple balloon. Looking at it more closely. So all I'm doing is I'm taking this little yellow area right here and I'm blowing it up. It is literally the same picture that I'm showing you. It's just zoomed in. There's the vestibular membrane, one layer of squish cells. There's the cochlear duct, the purple balloon in the middle of that maze. This right here, this little curly cue that you can see, this is called the tectorial membrane. This actually doesn't move when vibrations are going through, okay? You have a triplet set of hair cells out here. Remember I told you the hairs get bent? These cells, when there are vibrations in the fluid, actually go up and strike up against this tectoral membrane. And when that happens, that's how the hairs get bent. So that signal will go through. This is that basular membrane that we were talking about where these cells are sitting on top. Um, <clears throat> I want you to notice something else though. See this little cell right here? You've got one nucleus, that one dark purple spot. This is the hearing cell. These three that are out here deal with um, how tight everything is in there. They control the tension of that basular membrane. But this one single cell in the center is where our hearing comes from. Now, remember something. This is like a slice through that whole long cinnamon roll. So if I were to unravel, so here's my cinnamon roll. If I were to unravel it, every slice would have a set of cells like this, where I've got these three hair cells on the outside and the one hearing cell on the inside. 